Napier Center for Healing, you may be asking yourself the question, why is there a need for a Napier Center for Healing? Well, I'll give you a little bit of the background as to how this came about. On a routine visit to the Dennis Hurley Center, simply to see what was going on at the Dennis Hurley Center, I happened to end up by going to the clinic where people were living off the street or on the street. Some of them came in there for treatment of various ailments. And among them, I noticed that there were some who were kept at a distance. And I inquired of the doctor and his nurse why that was. They told me that these were the people who were suffering from addiction to a drug that is known as Wunga. It's a rather recent uh, arrival in our part of the world. And uh, Wunga has a very, very severe effect on a person's health. But one of the first visible signs of that effect on a person's health is that any contact with water on the skin sets the skin, it makes the skin feel as if it's absolutely a light. So they don't wash. As a result, when they come to the clinic, they're pushed out over into a corner, told, don't come, near, don't come near us, you're stinking. So what the doctor and his nurse had decided to do was to set up a satellite clinic down in a really run-down part of Durban, and um, they go there every Wednesday. So I was told, if you want to see how these people actually look and how many they are, come down to the Dalton area of uh, Durban any Wednesday when we go down there. So a few Wednesdays later, I went down to the cathedral and joined um, the Mary Ann Carpenter, who is the nurse there at the, at the clinic, and together we went down to the Dalton hostel area, a really run-down part of Durban where there was a terrible stench, there seemed to be a sewer that was open, but just the general, general unkempt look of the place made you feel that you were not in a very savoury part of town. But it was when I saw the human beings that were there, really run down human beings, that's when I really got touched, especially when I saw young people, young boys and girls among this motley crowd of men and women who were addicted to this terrible drug. And I watched there for a while as the doctor and his nurse were busy attending to people. They had an assistant as well, who was bandaging up wounds. Apparently, one of the effects of not, being, not washing and not, and not keeping general hygiene was that any wound, any sore that you get, becomes septic very easily and is long-lasting. So the nurse was patiently cleaning, cleaning and washing and uh, rebandaging uh, people's wounds. While I was busy observing this year, uh, one young chap came to me and he said, I'd like to go to rehab. So I asked him why and what he, what he thought rehab would do for him. So he says, no, he's tired of living on the streets. So I said, where are you from? He told me where he was from and then he told me his history. Still at school, second last year at school and a friend of his entices him to experiment with this drug. Just have a pull, man, it'll make you feel good. Which he did. And after a few uh, more attempts at this drug, he found himself absolutely hooked on it, so much so that he now had to feed a habit that was quite expensive to maintain. So he was stealing from his mother's purse, and next thing it was other items from her, or from the neighbors, until eventually they discovered the scale to which he was uh, stealing was really going to leave them with nothing in the house. So they kicked him out of the house. That's how he ended up on the street. I'd hardly finished talking to him. Then I said, wait a while, I'll find out what, you, what, what needs to be done. A second young man came and spoke to me, and his story was very much the same. So when they'd finished with them, I went to the doctor and I said, now I've had this two young chaps coming and asking me about what they need to do in order to go to rehab. And he said to me, OK, tell them that they must come every Tuesday and every Thursday to the Dennis Hurley Center. And uh, I said, OK. Afterwards, later on, I asked him, well, why did you say that? He said, because we have to test their determination, their resolve, whether they really are serious about going to rehab. So if they've got to go from that part of town to the Dennis Hurley Centre, it takes quite an effort to walk that distance. 
if they are if they are really convinced that they're going to they want to be healed, they will then do that, and we want them to go regularly to test their resolve. Then we would send them through, and uh, there's some hope of them coming off the addiction. So I returned to the young fellows. I told them what needed to be done, and I continued watching what the doctor was doing, and his nurses were doing to that young those young people. When I returned a few days later to the Dennis Hurley Center and informed um, uh, both the director of the Dennis Hurley Center, Raymond Perrier, and Paddy Carney, who's very active in, in setting up this center, I said to them, there's something we've got to do. Surely there's so many of our young people being affected by this disease. We've got to do something. And in my mind were these two young girls, uh, 16 to 18 years of age, and especially the one, the younger one, a uh, beautiful looking girl. Yeah, she's carrying a little baby on her, her back and all she's doing is waiting for someone to give her a smoke of the wunga. I thought, no, this we can't not do something about this. So between them, Paddy and uh, Raymond uh, got together some families who had members who were addicted to drugs of one form or another to do a little workshop so we could do a brainstorming together and see if there was something that we could do that was practical. And gradually the idea came out that maybe we should set up something in one of our old missions where there may be some buildings available. And we identified the uh, Ego Kanyeni, so a, a mission station out in the, in the countryside, a uh, short distance from Verulam, the nearest urban area, and isolated enough from the community as to not become a center where drugs could be brought in or be exported out. So it looked like a, a suitable place. So we went out and had a look at the place, we found that it had some, some things, very many things in its favor. A number of buildings, an old school building that had been uh, abandoned by the, the school the government had run there for many, many years, and it was now empty. Then there was a double-story building, which had been used at one, one stage as a kind of a hostel for pre-seminarians. These two buildings, uh, sets of buildings, really did lend themselves to development into such a centre. A second advantage of this was that there's quite a lot of, of, um, of ground and some of it quite fertile ground. So uh, cultivation of, of uh, vegetables and other things, fruit would be very easy to do there. But I think one of the best uh, advantages of that, it's isolated. But it's also a place where, it's where people can be close to nature and they can also at the same time uh, devote themselves to learning a skill, whether it's gardening, carpentry, building. And that's the advantage, I think, of having those more or less derelict buildings there. They could be restored into workshops, into other things that could be maybe the expansion of the Napier Centre at some stage in the future as the needs were, we were able to uh, meet a greater number of people who are in that need. So from there then we moved on to the planning stage, getting a committee together, and it was fantastic, really was touching, how people so readily joined, on into the, joined in with the idea, the concept first of all, and then started brainstorming themselves, this is what we could do, this is somebody who can help, and so on and so forth. So that we're becoming much uh, closer now, I think, to a reality of the Napier Centre coming into, uh, into service. But I think one last thought, which is absolutely, for me, it's one of the greatest incentives to keep going with this idea. During the Year of Mercy, Pope Francis outlined so many things they said these are the spiritual works of mercy, but they're also the corporal works of mercy. The two cannot be separated. So I would like you to take some of the spiritual works of mercy that you've practiced during this year of mercy, take those into the future. But let it be especially the corporal works of mercy. Things that you can see and things that will remind you of God's mercy on a day-to-day -day basis. That for me is where the Napier Centre will take on its full meaning, when it becomes the place where those corporal works of mercy, especially mercy, outreach to people who have lost their, their sense of worth as human beings, are once again able to feel 
I am really a beloved son or a beloved daughter of Jesus Christ, of God the Father, and a brother or sister of Jesus Christ. That, I think, is the essence of the Napier Center.